the geopolitical tension across the whole country is rising, the temperature is rising, people are feeling more insecure. And when you combine that with some of the macroeconomic data we're getting uh, from NBS, then uh, the situation is very dire. Inflation, uh, you know, is getting out of hand. Unemployment officially, the figures are now over 33 percent. You know, inflation over 18 percent. So we are we are in a way between the devil and the deep blue sea, uh, unfortunately. And um, we are veering now towards that um, unfortunate prize of being the world capital of kidnapping. Worse than war-torn Afghanistan, war, more than war-torn Darfur, more than war-torn Syria, you know, and uh, and war, more than war-torn Somalia. This is just incredible. Nobody would have imagined that our beloved Nigeria in the 21st century will end up as such a basket case. It is heartbreaking. Um, you can only give what you have. If you don't have competency, you can only give incompetency. If you don't have leadership, you will only give, uh, uh, you know, what monkeys will be interested to have. <laughs> you know, you, you can't give anything. Uh, uh, and so there's incompetence. And the thing is, the smartest leaders in the world always try to get competent people to work with them. Uh, in fact, uh, Warren Buffett, who is my hero, as far as the investment industry is concerned, that he wouldn't hire anybody who is not smarter than himself. Oh. So wise leaders will go out of their way to find people who are smarter than themselves. Don't feel uncomfortable with smart people. You know, you are the boss and you always be the boss, but you can hire people that are very bright, and you you give them targets, you give them responsibility. Unfortunately, uh, we are faced with incompetency and governance by cabals. Uh, I think, you know, the fate of 200 million people, some of them are kids with no, no paper qualifications, small children, you know, and, and you know, they are part of the cabals. They are the people deciding the fate of 200 million uh, people. So you can't give what you don't have. Uh, but it is not just incompetence. Uh, there's even this fear that some of the people in high places, uh, you know, know more about, about the insecurity than, you know, after all, it has become very big business, you know. The tech school children in the hundreds, then you go and meet them, you negotiate, they collect undisclosed sums of money, which are never properly invoiced or documented. And then the business continues. And then we 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 get to understand that some of these so-called bandits are actually collecting money for terrorists to buy more weapons uh, and to do more atrocities against unarmed and defenseless people. Mm. So it is a very murky business, a very terrible business, and very unfortunate for our country. Mm. Dr. May Lafia, recently yeah, yeah. Um, we've heard um, the president talking tough in the last um, two weeks or thereabouts, um, just before he jetted off to the UK. Uh, the president did tell the service chiefs to go after sponsors of insecurity. He also told them that they can no longer allow terrorists and bandits to dictate uh, the pace in the country and in the fight against um, insecurity. Do you think at this point the president has woken up to the reality that the country is faced with as far as insecurity is concerned? I hope so. I mean, they've made the right noises. Um, the Minister of Defense, Honorable Minister of Defense, uh, a, a gentleman I respect highly, you know, 
uh, also made very positive statements. So did the national security advisor, who is a very decent person and is very excellent, an excellent professional. And I hear they're even trying to persecute him for coming out strongly to say, look, some of the monies that we are committed for security and defense cannot be properly accounted for. And I hear they are coming for him and some of his people. So at the end of the day, you ask yourself, if there is a cabal that controls the president, nothing will change until the cabal is dissolved. And the president has people that truly have his interest and the interest of, this peop of, the, of, the, of, the, of the of the people of this country in mind. That is the only way we will begin to take seriously anything they say. As of now, they are basically in a monologue. They're talking to themselves. Nigerians don't believe them. Made those statements, uh, as you would imagine. I came under very horrendous, uh, you know, persecution, you know, and uh, I still don't consider myself a free man, even as I'm speaking to you, uh, you know, because I think I offended too many powers and uh, that has been a problem. Well, I'm happy that the president has made this kind of statement and uh, I'm not one of those who want to rush so much to seek self-vindication. I didn't speak because I wanted to be famous or I wanted to be notorious. Or as they say in this part of the country, I was looking for relevance. Uh, some people said I was eyeing 2023 and all that kind of thing. None of those things. In fact, I prayed to the good Lord every day. I said, Lord, I, I wish I'm not right. I wish I was totally wrong and that things are not as bad as the, the, that, the way you've shown them to me. They're not as bad as that. But unfortunately, uh, things are very awful. And yes, in a way, I, I feel vindicated. Mm -hmm. I was invited three times. And uh, in fairness to the gentlemen of the DSS, they were very professional with me. They were very firm with me and they were doing their job. And of course, as you know, they are very hierarchical, you know. They were always referring every 10 minutes to Abuja, whoever that was in Abuja they were referring to, I, I would not know. But the line of questioning um, didn't lead me to believe that um, it was an attempt to better understand what was happening. I, I think it was more adversarial, mm. you know, and I got the feeling that I, I had no right to say what I was saying. I wouldn't want to go into all the details, uh, but, you know, I, I respect them. They were very professional with me. But I didn't leave feeling that the powers behind the powers were necessarily happy with what I said. It was like, you had no right to say this. Now, by the way, other people have said worse things. Nothing has happened to them. You know, one of the spokespeople of the APC himself said pretty much the same thing. In fact, he zeroed it down to a particular geopolitical zone and nothing happened to him, you know? So people have said worse things and it's like, and I was asking myself, is it because I'm from Southern Kaduna? Is it because I'm from the Middle Belt? Is it because I'm a Christian? Why, why are they persecuting me? You know, that sort of thing. I, I had, you know, cause to feel that it had become a persecution. And uh, I thank God because people prayed for me Thousands of uh, people turned out. And by the way, my strongest supporters were actually Muslim youths. Well, thank you, ma'am. It's, it's, it's very, very dangerous. 
it's extremely uh, dangerous and uh, it, it leads to the kind of problems we've been discussing. It leads to lawlessness, it leads to criminality. And not only that, the, the social damage, even spiritual damage, you know, uh, young people postpone marriage because they are looking for a job after national service. I've got to find a job before I can think of having a family and so on and so forth. This prolonged stay becomes demoralizing. For the young girls, it can lead to all kinds of social problems. And, uh, you know, so, you know, the, the, the impact on society is incalculable. And the only solution, in my view, is to launch a mass-based agro-industrial revolution. That's the only way that we can absorb these millions of army of unemployed youths. Mm. Uh, because the most dangerous and the most potent enemy you can have is a young man who is hungry as well as angry. And unfortunately, the answers was just a little tip of what can happen if we do not address the needs of the young people of this country. And it's a terrible tragedy is that most of them are thinking about how to go to Europe, how to go to Canada, how to go to America, how to go anywhere else but Nigeria. We have failed to create an inner directed and an inner generated locomotive of growth and prosperity for our people. And that is a tragedy. Mm. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Melafia, that you talk about developing the agro uh, sector of the country. Incidentally, even agro industrial. Agri Sorry, agro industrial. Agro industrial. Agro industrial. Agri okay. Agro industrial. Not just agro. Agro industrial. But agro Linking the value chain in agriculture to yes. industry. Great. Mm. The agro-industrial will flow from the agri itself. That's from farming, I suppose. Correct? Yes. Now, yes. Yes. we already have a situation in the country where farmers cannot go to farm. So where, yeah. where is the starting point in such a circumstance? Well, I mean, thank you again. You are very right. Uh, in fact, as we talk, let's see how the rest of the year goes because there might be outbreaks of farming because a lot of farmers can't go back to their farms, particularly in the middle belt, which is the breadbasket of Nigeria. Uh, it is a middle belt that fits the country, basically. And when most of these people can't go to their farms, then you have a recipe for disaster. And... Uh, this year, unfortunately, we may, we may face the prospect of hunger. If this trend continues, and even if during this coming rainy season, people still cannot go to farms to plant their crops, then, you know, we are in for, for trouble, seriously. Mm. Uh, doctor, there are other people who have also said that um, looking at the unemployment figures, how scary it is, that uh, probably it's time for the government to expand the social safety nets to bring in more people and also invest more in human uh, capital development. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? Well, they are all very good, but you know, um, I wouldn't want a situation whereby we become a country that is based on an entitlement mentality, an entitlement mindset. It's about give me, give me, give me. Most Nigerians are very hardworking. In fact, most Nigerians don't expect handouts. They just want an opportunity to work and to help themselves. The primary duty of government, as far as I'm concerned, is number one, security. Let there be security of lives and properties for all Nigerians. And be very tough on that. You have to crush anybody that wants to take the law into their hands and cause problems here and there and be ruthless about it 
When you stamp out insecurity, then you create an atmosphere where farmers can go to their farms, you know, uh, there's no fear of kidnapping. There's no fear of random nihilistic violence and killings. And then, you know, you build the infrastructures that will support product, production. And once you do that, and you create a balanced macroeconomic framework, uh, low prices, low inflation, uh, infrastructure networks, uh, support institutional services and the rest of them and just watch this country bloom and of course invest in in human capital you need not just paper certificate these days paper certificate will take you nowhere you must have skills mm. you must have productive skills and you must have pride in labor in using your knowledge and your skills to to produce and contribute to the economy. And we need to teach our young people, uh, not just paper, paper, you know, certificates, mm. but real Doctor, skills. I'm talking about uh, paper certificates and well, uh, I want to focus a little on education. Mm. Increased education has been scientifically um, linked to, linked with lower rates of crime and insecurity. What about the education sector? What about, like you said, skills, uh, the acquisition of skills by young Nigerians? What should, be the, what should the government be doing in this regard? Just recently, um, we, I, I read something about um, um, major international organizations um, like um, Netflix, who are now saying, like Google, who are saying that by 2021, a university degree will no longer be required for hiring anyone at all. It will be based on skills. But here we are still talking about paper qualification. But in spite of that, what is the level of skills and education that Nigeria needs that can help to reduce the rates of, um, bring the rates of crime and criminality to the barest minimum? Well, thank you again, ma'am, for that very important uh, question. In fact, Google have already been doing it. Uh, they now go about recruiting people who have something to offer Google, you know, technological skills, you know, creativity, problem solving skills. Uh, they are recruiting those kind of people and, you know, paying them huge amounts. Uh, and uh, so already they are doing it. But let's not overstate the case. Every country needs certain standards. Otherwise, how can you compare? If you are recruiting people, how can you compare? You, there has to be a basis for comparison of some sorts. So in respect of that, paper qualifications will still play a very important role. Absolutely. Uh, you know. But having said that, the content of that paper qualification is what matters. In Germany, for example, you can never be a, an engineering graduate until you have spent two years in the factory floor. Not designing things, working with your hands, right from the factory floor to you know, the production process, you are all part of it. And you are certified before you can now go back to the university and say you are an engineering graduate. Uh, and then, um, this is true of many of the sciences also in Germany, and, uh, just an example. So we need technology skills. We need to strengthen numeracy skills. We need to strengthen the literacy skills. Unfortunately, when you hear some of our young graduates talking, I mean, I was told a few years ago, the former DG of uh, NYC actually complained that some of the graduates could not properly fill the forms for the NYC. They needed help. And this is just very alarming. And, you know, it's, it's very shocking. And I went to a missionary school, and I can tell you, uh, you know, that our standard of English in Form 3 and I'm not, with all respect to all graduates and so on, I'm not being arrogant or bragging, 
our standard of written and spoken English in Form 3 was what your average graduate today is. Of course, we were taught by white missionaries, so the standard was extremely high. But you see even professors mixing their syntax and their, and their tenses. So you ask yourself, what, what are they really teaching these kids? And half of the time, they're on strike anyway. So the standards have fallen abysmally. But having said that, I'm very proud of our young people. They are doing wonderful things, some of them, in technology. You know, you know of a young girl a few weeks ago who won the best prize in mathematics across yes. the whole world, a Nigerian girl. Mm -hmm. She beat the Chinese, she beat the Japanese, she beat the Europeans. So there are still young people who are doing wonderful things. So mm. when we are criticizing the system, we are talking on the law of averages. That is the problem. Uh, many people go into university, some of them with fake papers, they bribe the lecturers, they don't attend classes, they're issuing certificates, they go to NYC, they are unemployable, their numeracy and literacy skills are almost nil. So, you know, we have very big problems. And part of the solution is that you do not allow anyone to go through the system without ensuring that, you know, their numeracy, their literacy skills are strong and that they don't go into the, the market without one skill or the other. We need to put that into the pedagogy. All right. And the pedagogy should be hands on. It should not just be rote learning. There's too much memory and just passing. Mm. And some of these people are just you can't you can't do anything with them. All so right. that, that's really important. All right, Dr. Melafia, before we round off, let's talk a bit about insecurity again and let's go straight to your state in Kaduna. At a point when uh, different states are going at cross purposes on how to deal with the problem of insecurity, your state governor, Nasir El Rufai, has said no more payment or settlement with bandits. Do you agree with his stance? Well, Marlon Nasir El Rufai used to be a very good friend of mine. Um, I regard him as a good friend. I don't know whether he regards me as a good friend also, but in fairness to him, there are some things he has done right. You know, and I, this is one of them. Uh, you know, the resolve not to pay bandits. And I hope they keep to it. And uh, I, in Italy, you know, they have this big problem of kidnapping in Italy, uh, including the kidnapping of a former prime minister, Aldo Moro. I remember I was in secondary school in those days, uh, you know, and um, Aldo Moro was kidnapped, and uh, the kidnappers were negotiating for huge sums. Uh, when they couldn't get, get it, they wrote, they asked him to write his final letter to his wife before they executed him. Very deeply moving. You, you can't, you almost shed a tear when you read that letter. And after that, the Italian government enacted a law. The parliament enacted a law. It was a very draconian law. It simply outlawed any form of kidnapping. Whoever it is, you are not to pay one dime. And in fact, anybody that pays money, even from, for his own family member, can be imprisoned. You in Italy, you are not allowed to pay one euro for anybody kidnapped. But, 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 what but, the authorities? Yes, doctor. The authorities used to do. Doctor, that sound that sounds uh, fantastic. But in, in a context of a situation like we have in Nigeria, where you really do not have, uh, I've seen any capacity of Nigerian security agencies through the use of maybe special forces, if it even exists to embark on rescue missions where kidnapping yeah. incident takes place. Is it not premature for such a stance? I'll give you an example, a typical example, in Afaka in southern Kaduna at the moment. 39 students that were abducted from the uh, College of Agricultural Mechanization are still in the custody, uh, the captivity of bandits. The parents have been crying every day saying the state's government has to do everything to get them out because they've done it before. If you were in that position as a governor of the state, what would you do? Now, this is too close to comfort. 
this is my homeland and these people have suffered too much. It's been crisis after crisis, killing after killing, and it is bordering on genocide. This is really what is happening. And the whole world has been very silent. And, uh, but the government has to do something. The people of Southern Kaduna do not feel that they are part of the state. We are living in an apartheid situation. There is apartheid in Kaduna state. There is a division in which our people have been excluded. We have no feeling of belonging. When you say your people, and you mean the people of Southern Kaduna? Of course, they, they don't feel a sense of belonging. Uh, they feel discriminated against, and they have been at the receiving end of all these, uh, you know, genocidal killings. Uh, and uh, we hope that somebody somewhere will be touched from the point of view of their conscience and will do something about it. But our people have become very distrustful. We do not feel that these people care about us. In fact, we feel that in the, uh, indirectly, they, have, they are enjoying what the Germans call Schadenfreude. It's a German word, uh, no English equivalent. When you take pleasure in the suffering of others, there's a, a sense of Schadenfreude about what is going on in Southern Kaduna. We feel that the authorities don't really give a damn about us. Uh, but we hope that there can be a change of heart uh, and uh, something will be done. But until that happens, my advice to our people is that those who are about to die have a right to defend themselves.